Hello, my name is Suzanne Desvonick. Uh, this training today is going to be brought to you by Rise Westmoreland, my nonprofit. We're going to talk today about trauma informed schools. Uh, this is a compilation of guided resources uh, for the school educator or any um, member of the community. I'm a threat assessment and school safety provider and a mental health and first aid provider. And I'm also a mother and a teacher. In section one, we're going to talk about trauma-informed care. We're going to talk about the types of trauma that can occur. We're going to talk about how you recognize signs and what someone can do to help someone who has suffered from a trauma. So we're going to take a little detailed look at what trauma-informed care is. Uh, th in this classroom that we're going to take a look at, this has been implemented already, trauma-informed care. It's our goal, after looking at this, to find the details of what you would want to do in your own classroom or your own school. What does it mean to, to make the world a better place? Nice! So those are those big questions we're focusing on. For me, being trauma-informed has so much to do with mindset. Accepting that different people come into a school setting with incredibly varied life experiences. Some of those life experiences may be traumatic and the way in which that plays out in my particular classroom could look a number of ways. And by me having that lens, it makes it less about are they doing the right thing or the wrong thing and more about where is that behavior coming from? Why is that happening? Adverse childhood experiences like poverty, neglect, exposure to violence can bring about overwhelming stress, which can cause negative effects on the learning brain and on behavior. If children have the experience of adversity, they will have uneven development of these foundational skills like self-regulation and executive function or relationship skills. These are the children who are at risk to fall further and further behind. But the good news is that there is a powerful antidote to stress, and that is the effect of the human relationship and the presence of trust. Schools are an ideal place to produce many different kinds of relationships that are capable of buffering stress. Schools themselves can be healing places if you're fearful, if you're anxious, if you're distracted about something that's happened to you, you literally can't learn. Your brain shuts down. So it's essential to give kids social and emotional tools that allow students to recover from the challenges that they have experienced. Take actual classroom time to work on the building blocks of how to perceive your emotions, how to talk about them, how to get along with other people, how to take a moment and become calm when you need to, how to express your needs so that others can meet them. When we start to understand what it takes to be responsive to the effects of trauma, we need to think about the environment, about individual services, and we need to think about the skills and mindsets of kids that won't develop as they should when they're impacted by trauma. I do a lot of work around self-awareness and being able to name emotions and then make a choice around those. When I get mad, I take deep breaths and that helps me get more calm. Mm. Many of the things that we think about doing for kids who may have experienced trauma are good for everybody. And everyone will encounter some kind of adverse circumstance at some point in their life. And for some children, we're helping them deal with what's already happened in their lives. For others, we're preparing them to deal with the challenges later in their lives. If you can hear my voice say, we are awesome. <laughs>
objectively analyzing any complex data and engaging in memory consolidation. So what that means is their brains are working on trying to solve the traumatic event and not working on what's being presented to them in the classroom setting. Adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, are very important to the trauma-informed classroom. So a study was completed, completed by the CDC in 1998 and has yielded some very amazing results showing that children that have high ACE scores, which is a lot of adverse childhood experiences, are then prone to chronic disease as adults, social emotional problems, heart disease, lung cancer, diabetes, and many other autoimmune dis diseases. They're also prone to depression, violence, and being a victim of suicide. You'll see on your first handout that there are 10 questions on the ACEs scale. Something that we need to talk about in trauma-informed care is whether or not we feel that this should be something that we give to children that are showing problem behavior. So I'm going to show you a little video today about what ACEs is and how we are using that to determine what might happen to this child as they grow. What does your parents' divorce have to do with your risk for heart disease? If your mother had a drinking problem when you were growing up, are you more likely to suffer from depression as an adult? Here's what you should know about ACEs. ACEs stand for Adverse Childhood Experiences, extremely stressful events that can happen to a child growing up. Some experiences are so stressful that they can alter brain development as well as the immune system increasing the risk of lifelong health and social problems in adulthood. The term comes from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, landmark research that shed new light on the root cause of everything from stroke and liver disease to substance abuse and mental illness. In the late 1990s, an epidemiologist from the Centers for Disease Control and a preventive medicine doctor at Kaiser Permanente set out to understand the association between childhood experience and lifelong health. They asked over 17,000 people in the Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego about their health history, as well as difficult questions about their experiences growing up. Anda and Felitti tallied up 10 different kinds of adversity in this largely middle-class and college-educated population. They were stunned to see how common ACEs were. 21% of all respondents were sexually abused as children. 19% grew up with someone who suffered mental illness. 28% had been physically abused. And two out of three respondents had experienced at least one ACE. The researchers next looked at how someone's ACE score, or the number of adversities they experienced, related to a wide array of serious health and social problems. They saw that the more ACEs someone had, the greater their risk for poor outcomes compared with someone with no ACEs. Someone with an ACE score of four had twice the risk of heart disease and cancer. Someone with an ACE score of five had an eight times greater chance of being an alcoholic. And those with an ACE score of six or more, on average, died 20 years earlier. With every major problem they looked at in the ACE study, the risk went up for each additional adverse experience in childhood.
As Dr. Robert Anda says, what's predictable is preventable. It's important to remember that ACEs are not destiny. ACEs are a tool for understanding the health of a population as a whole. For individuals, an ACE score can be a tool for understanding their own risk for health and social problems and empower them to make changes for themselves and their children. ACEs tend to get passed down from generation to generation and are common across all income levels, races, and cultures. But increasingly, people of all different professions and backgrounds are coming together to discuss how ACEs affect their communities. They're finding new ways to treat and prevent ACEs. Many doctors are starting to screen their patients for ACEs as part of their medical history. More schools are becoming trauma-informed, considering the source of problem behavior when disciplining their students instead of immediately suspending or expelling them. To learn more about interrupting the cycle of adversity and improving health and well-being for the next generation, please visit kpjrfilms.co. So after looking at the video, it's very staggering to think about what happens in your childhood and how it affects you as an adult. So you look at the high A scores, risk factors being some re-experiencing. So you're constantly, constantly thinking about the event, replaying it in their, your mind, having nightmares, um, avoiding, um, avoiding situations where you feel that you could be traumatized again. Uh, negative conditions and mood. So blaming others, diminished interest, um, not being very happy, um, inability to remember things and key events. Also a heightened arousal. This is something that you see more in the elementary and your middle school setting, um, where being on edge, being on the lookout all of the time, and we call that the flight, fight or flight. So what does the research show? The research shows that more than 50% of students in the classroom have experienced one or more adverse childhood event. That could include uh, physical, sexual, verbal abuse, emotional neglect, an alcoholic parent or parent addicted to drugs, um, witnessing a mother who may have experienced abuse or a father or sibling, losing a parent to abandonment or divorce, and oftentimes incarceration. The time in the life when the brain is the most sensitive is infancy and childhood. So if a trauma, a traumatic event occurs at this time, later on in life you will see physical problems occur. Types of trauma in childhood. We talked about that as being maybe a frightening or dangerous event. Loss of a grandparent is very, very, very common. Um, we don't think of that as being traumatic because it happens so often. However, some children are unable to understand that and they aren't able to move forward from that. So here I like to tell a little story about a child who uh, ran out of my classroom every single time a fire truck or a police car went by. Every time, he lost his recess. Why? Because I didn't know where he was going and I didn't know why he was running. After talking to him and looking into some counseling, what we found was that he was traumatized because in his household, he was frequently taken away by the police or the fire department because of abuse that was occurring in his home. So what we have to do as educators, as stakeholders in these children's lives, is step back and try to understand why the behavior is occurring. So recognizing trauma, there's so many ways to do this. And um, I do have some links in the presentation that you can read more about. But your common ones would be withdrawal. It would be uh, school problems, being off over bossy or controlling, um, clinginess, beginning of drug and alcohol use, um, irritability, sleeplessness, those types of typical behaviors that you might see in a teen, but it might not be for that reason. So we want to talk a little bit more today about becoming a trauma-informed school. And becoming a trauma-informed school, you need to educate your staff. That's what's happening right now. Talk about it. Discuss it. What does it look like? Provide safety. Again, um, I'm being certified in school safety. So can we talk about how our school can become a safer place? Absolutely. Um, holistic approach. So that would be uh, working with mindfulness in your classroom setting. Um, through uh, my nonprofit, I can support that. 
and other places can also support mindfulness in your classroom. Working in the community, um, holding uh, families accountable, and also being adaptable. In section two, we're going to talk about mental health first aid for children, and this would also include adolescents. Uh, in this case, this can apply to parents, caregivers, any stakeholder, clergy, anyone that is in contact with children on a regular basis. So a little bit about mental health first aid. Um, it helps us to understand what is mental health, uh, reduces the misconceptions that many people have regarding mental health, like stigma, and helps us to prepare for a crisis that could include specific skills to teach the child or the youth how to deal with an issue that they may have in crisis. We finally have enough knowledge of how stress gets embedded into human beings and how it affects the journey of life that we can be the generation that shifts the whole future of the public's health. We know that children can't learn if they're focused on pain or if they're on high alert because they've experienced a lot of toxic stress. And if our goal is to help kids learn and be productive citizens, we have to deal with all aspects of their lives. It's not a secret. Some kids bring real issues to school with them and they, they can't just leave them at the door. If teachers don't learn how to address the child's need, the whole child, from the educational standpoint, the mental standpoint, the physical standpoint, they're not going to make an impact in that child's life. Let's go guys, Let's clear it up. When we first went into Calumet Park, the stakeholders there identified three main areas they were concerned about, behavioral and trauma care, primary care and wellness, and parent engagement. Anytime you're trying to make a difference for a child, you need to know the parents. Parent involvement is a huge piece. When you've got parents involved, you've got a better student. Parents need to know what their children are learning. Parents need to know how they can help the teachers as it relates to their child's future. I want to be here because I want to see how the teacher work with my kids. I'm a working grandmother. I'm raising two grandchildren. I did running, jumping, I did the whole bit. It brought us a little closer together. They were doing things that I didn't think they could do and I was doing stuff that they knew I couldn't do, but I fooled them. The culinary arts program was really popular. The kids got a chance to cook with their family, with their parents. We had sometimes groups of eight family members at a station. At home, I don't have the time to let them to participate. Here is the, all the time for them to do it, to cut, to help. It was a full house back there in the culinary arts room. It was packed. Teachers were doing hands-on stuff with parents. Just to see the interactions was really cool. Do I care if you get a perfect score on the test? No. Do I care that you gave it your best effort on the test. A lot of the times we focus on just the academic and we forget that there might be underlying reasons why students aren't successful in the classroom. The dental van was the first big win of the initiative and it was successful right from the get-go. Most of the districts had dentists that came out and did screenings, but what the kids really needed was restorative care. You brushing every day? 
I'm gonna find out, man. I'm gonna know in a couple seconds. A lot of dental vans do the cleaning, but then they give referrals to get the restorative work done elsewhere. And not many families get the restorative work done because these are stressed families and dental care is not their top priority. So you got one, two, three, four cavities, okay? So we're gonna need to let mom know. We've had some students that need a lot of work because of aggressive decay. I've definitely seen it where they're at the point that they're crying actually when you ask them if it hurts. And next time we're going to take some pictures of your teeth so that we can see where the rest of the cavity Put yourself in those shoes. Go to work every single day with pain and try to do 110% on anything and it's just not going to happen. They're not going to tell the teacher that they didn't do their homework because their teeth and their mouth was throbbing. They're just not going to do it. You've got the same dentist who can do the screening, then they don't have to refer out to anybody, they just invite the students back in and they do the restorative care. The consent goes home that we need some follow-up care and it gets back to us. All that Calumet Park has to provide are consents in kids. Mayor Ronald Denson has been a huge advocate of the school district. This is a special person. Like yeah. yeah. If we don't get a better handle on crime in our towns and, and health care and, and all of those things, that we kind of put them off to the side, I think we're going to fail a whole generation of children. One of the principles of being a trauma-informed system is to assume that everybody has been exposed to trauma. The way I think about it is how you would act towards someone you love in your family if you got a call from them earlier in the day that something horrible happened. If a child has experienced toxic stress and they're in fight or flight mode, then it's impossible for them to be focused on the lesson. I can hear somebody say to me, five times five is 25, but I didn't understand it. You're processing it as, is this something that I need to worry about right now? No, it's not. It's not anything that's threatening me physically at this point. There's no emotional threat, so I need to move on to what is. With a trauma-informed model, you don't go at the consequence right when they come in. You gotta let a kid de-escalate. Traditionally, it's dealt with in a disciplined manner. The child breaks a rule, we give them a consequence. We've had things like zero tolerance, three strikes and you're out. Keeping kids as much as possible in school holds them so much more accountable than putting them out. Schools that suspend and suspend become a pipeline for prison. Prison builders look at third grade data to determine how many prison cells they're going to have. They're making beds for them already. Knowing that some of our children have these things that have gone on, a parent is divorced, a sibling has died, we have to handle things a little differently. My day-to-day -day routine in the morning is to set the tone. Good morning, young people. I just get my little hug, Justin. And that gives me an opportunity to see who wants to talk to me. You gonna come to me? I know. I usually try and pull them to the side and talk to them, find out what's going on, ask them if they feel like talking. Don't lecture them, don't tell them what to do, just listen. I think that's the biggest thing that I do as a dean is kind of be an active listener. And I make sure the kids know whenever they come to me, they're going to have the opportunity to talk. There's an expression that's been said, they don't care what you know until they know that you care. The research tells us the number one thing that has the greatest impact on student achievement is the quality of the teacher. And if you ask teachers to look at outstanding teachers, it's those who can build relationships with kids. A student doesn't have any reason to want to do what you want them to do until they feel a connection. They see that I really, really care. They know that I'm stern, I'm fair, and I love them. And I remind them, I believe in you. And they look at me, really? I'm like, yeah, I do. 
One of the things that we started a couple of years ago was a peace room. Traditional in-school suspension, you'll sit there and face the wall, do nothing, homework, what have you. The peace room is a place to come to when you're acting out and you need time out. It's just a place where the kids can go and know that they have the opportunity to get themselves together, get a second chance. I have an interesting brain break for you today. So let's stand up. It's gonna involve some concentration on your part. There's research that says kids should be playing games to strengthen their executive function. We should never move PE and recess and opportunities for young people to take a break. Vigorous aerobic activity has been shown to help the hippocampus regenerate new neurons. And the hippocampus is a center for memory and learning. When the students get tired, we play some music. We play we, the teacher dances, the student dances, we sing. Hey, hey. It does something to their brain. So then, then when I'll say, now we need to get focused. Now it's five, four, three, two, one. I got them back. In Calumet Park, we worked really hard to get the right people to participate in this effort. To have buy-in from the teachers and the administrators and the boards, you have to have a collaborative relationship. As union president, I want to make sure my teachers have the resources they need. And I want to be able to say, I had some part in changing what happened in this district. This resonates so deeply with educators. This is like the missing piece in the puzzle. It has changed the way we view these kids' issues, and it allows us to respond differently. My hope is that we will implement social and emotional learning as part of our everyday regular curriculum so that it becomes just as important as math and reading and writing. The beauty of a trauma-informed system is that it benefits everybody. I think what we're really talking about doing is looking at this as a public health problem, much like we took on smoking or wearing seat belts. We can't control what adversity our children face in life, but if we've given them the skills to self-regulate effectively and to make social connections, then they're going to be okay. After we watched the video, we found out what it looks like to apply mental health first aid into the classroom setting and into the school environment. So what do we see in the school setting? Terminology has changed. It is no longer okay to say what is wrong with this child, but it is okay to say what has happened to this child. This change in thought process might be a little bit slower moving, but it is coming. According to uh, the Center for Early Childhood Mental Health Consultation, Children who experience trauma can live in a near constant state of fight or flight. So with these stress hormones, their cortisol levels and their adrenaline is constantly flowing and they feel that they're under a real threat. So we cannot say, what is wrong with you? You can ask them, what has happened to you? To decide if your school is ready, we will look at this uh, rating scale. Are you ready to implement something like this in your district? You would have to look at the rating scale and see where you lie. At that point, you could access more resources if you need them. How does trauma affect learning? So with the fight or flight responses being overactivated in the brains of these students, um, their learning and memory centers of the brain are, are just turned down in general. So they may become forgetful, disengaged, unable to concentrate. Um, it permanently affects the brain forever and alters their brain for the rest of their lives. Students can become disengaged and just really unable to concentrate. When we talk about the impact of trauma, this video is going to talk about how the 
trauma has affected the academic performance of many students. Well, let me start with what does it look like in school? What do these impacts look like in school? And I'm going to talk about academics, behavior, and relationships. And on the academic side, I'm going to talk about two areas. One is foundations for learning and the other is learning process. In foundations for learning, the first thing is language. The ability to comprehend and utilize expressive language, both verbally and non-verbally. Ability to understand body language or non-verbal elements of communication can be as hindered as the linguistic side. And again, I want to be clear, not every child presents with this, but as I go through the list, pick one or two and see what that does to the child's ability to perform in school. And so ability to um, process and utilize language. Memory, particularly sequential memory, cause effect, if A then B. The ability to develop meaningful chronologies. Think about how we teach critical thinking in ELA. We read a story, before we get to the end of the story we say, what do you think is going to happen next? We're asking the child to take information, organize it, and make a reasonable prediction about what might happen next. And whether they get the right answer or not isn't the issue. The issue is, can they utilize this process, because that is the critical thinking we want to teach them. Mindful, upper brain level mindful, right? Think about a student who's impacted by traumatic experience and can't create these sequential cause-effect chronologies. I watched a second grade child in a reading group, oral reading, and the teacher's reading a book about two kids. Money, going to the store, buy bread and milk. And the students are listening, teacher gets, kids get to the front of the store, she stops the store and says, what do you think is going to happen next, children? This one kid's raising his hand, like frantically. She goes, yes, Joey, tell us, what do you think is going to happen next? Oh, they're going to buy a dog. And she dealt with that in a very nice way, you know, well, you know, they're going to buy something, but it's not a dog, and, you know, does anyone else, and it was bread and milk, and so everything's cool. After the lesson, I sit with the child, and the child's, um, someone who knows the child, and I asked him, I said, why did you say dog? And he said, you know, I always wanted a dog, and I know they were going to buy something, but I figured, why not a dog? Well, is he really developing critical things? I mean, he got a couple of pieces. They're at the store, they're going to buy something. But the whole thing of mom asking, bread, milk, here's the money. I mean, think of that chronology. He's taking his own desires and wants. He's projecting it into the story. It's not about critical thinking for him. It's about, yeah, I got a couple pieces out of the story. Let me kind of project my own piece in. That's the way it goes, <laughs> right? Let's talk about academic performance learning process, ability to get work done. And I start here with executive function. Executive function is something we do every day. It's about identifying a goal, creating a plan to accomplish that goal, executing the plan, taking the action, and then stepping back and saying, how'd that work for me? Reviewing that. And if it worked for me, I, I was able to get that task done in an effective way, as I define effective, then I'm going to remember that process I'm going to store it away and the next time I have to do that, I'm going to reach out, grab it, and I'm going to bring it in. I'm going to use it again. And what did I just describe? A remembered cause-effect chronology of goal setting, planning, execution, and review. If I have trouble with sequential memory, if I have trouble with cause-effect, I'm not going to be able to do this. Every time I'm presenting a task, it's going to be like it's the first time I've I've seen that task. I come into your classroom and we've been doing it this way all year long, but maybe I'm still struggling with how do I begin this task. Transitions. Transitions can be very difficult for students impacted by traumatic experience. Think about that student who's, you know, those MRI pictures. Now he comes into the classroom, sits in the back corner of the room. Got a whiteboard here, a bunch of windows there, and scanning. What's the noise in the hallway? How close is the teacher to me? Is he talking about me? What's that noise over there? And they're constantly scanning, looking for it. Think of your own self when you don't feel safe. How, you know, we have all these filters that kind of keep extraneous information away from us, right? We filter stuff out, we stay focused, right? But when we're not feeling safe, what happens to those filters? Boom, they're down. I'm hearing everything. Well, here's this child in the back of the room hearing everything, seeing 
everything. And it gets kind of quiet, you know, transition's done, kids are in the, and the classroom gets quiet because now people have work to do and they're starting to do the work. And so the child goes, oh, okay, well, okay. So what's happening here? And there's a paper on his desk and people are working. And it would be great if that child raised their hand and said, excuse me, I've been a little hypervigilant here in the back of the room <laughs> and I don't have any idea about what this paper is about. Could you help me out? It actually would be great, wouldn't it? Up to that much self worth But of course they don't do that. In the best of circumstances, you get a student who has skills to get through the lesson. Name, date, is there a word bank around? What's Eddie doing? Joe, don't look at Eddie's paper. You can do this yourself. Okay, okay, right? That's the best. And again, we're not building framework, cognitive scaffolding. We're developing splinter skills to get through the lesson. Let me get through. Let me get to the end of this period. This student, you know, will use these different skills to get through the lesson, and that's the best situation. Imagine the student says, I'm not working today. Tears the paper in half. Mm -hmm. Throws an F-bomb out. Um, you know, I used to think that F-bombs didn't occur in elementary school. Um, <laughs> I know. Naive Joe. <laughs> really. Um, so that's transitions and, and how they can be uh, difficult. Attention. Now think about this student I just described um, who's paying all this attention to all this stuff. Is this student, because a lot of these kids will come with ADHD diagnoses, but what they found is it's not that they're not paying attention, they're in fact paying very close attention to all the wrong stuff, right? Tone of voice, physical space, <coughs> things that are happening that we're probably filtering out. I worked with this child um, and I was walking down the, the, the hallway early in the morning and I walked by the teacher's room and she goes, Joe, 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 I, he's just, uh, he, uh, we're not starting the day well. Do you have a few minutes? Sure. Come on. So we go for a walk. We sit down in a space that's available and I say, what's up, you know, and, and we're talking and he's just somewhere else. You can see it in his eyes. He, he's not with me, he's somewhere else. And I go, oh, what's up? What's going on? And I know him pretty well, and he goes, do you hear that noise? And I listen quietly, and I can't hear it. And I'm thinking, oh, great, great, auditory hallucinations. <laughs> I said, no, no, really, what noise? He goes, you know, it's like, like a machine. And I listen again, and you hear this very faint, low-frequency rumble of heavy equipment. I go, that noise? He goes, yeah. I said, yeah. He goes, yeah, I hear it. He goes, do you think they're going to dig and hit a gas pipe like what happened on Elm Street last week? And the week before, in the city, backhoe had been digging on the street, accidentally hit a gas line, gas went into the house, blew the house to smithereens. Now, fortunately, there was no one home. But he comes into school, he hears that low frequency that most of us are totally tuned out. And he's sitting in that class wondering, where do I go when the school blows up? When is the school, is it now, is it now? So he's in this agitated, hypervigilant state. And I say, oh, they're just spreading dirt out on the, the playground out there. He goes, hmm, really? So okay, so we get up and we walk out and there's a big bulldozer spreading a pile of dirt. I said, see, they're not digging. Mm -mm. We stop the nice person driving the, the, the caterpillar bulldozer. I said, excuse me, go ahead, ask him. Are you going to be digging any holes? No, Sonny, we're just spreading dirt today, not digging any holes. And you watch this child just relax. All that tension went out because the school wasn't going to blow up because of the gas leak. Right? Went back in. I didn't see him for the rest of the day, so I'm assuming he had a pretty good rest of the day. Right? But that's, you know, when we talk about attention and hearing all this and where are they, gives you a sense of what can be going on in the heads. The emotional effects of trauma that can look like your everyday child or adolescent. Rage, anger, physical and verbal aggression, outward physical movements like trembling, hyperactivity, mood swings, things that all parents see. So what we need to step back and look at is, is this normal behavior? Is this typical behavior of this child or is this 
possible PTSD? Is it possible depression, self-hatred? Is it guilt or shame? So we need to step back and look at the ACE score. Has something happened to this child? Is this why these emotional effects are occurring? The National Child Traumatic Stress Network has a large guide that is also linked in the presentation. And what they stress is that having learned that the world is a dangerous place where even loved ones can't be trusted to protect you, children are more vigilant and guarded in their interactions with others and are more likely to perceive situations as stressful and dangerous. I had a student one time that would not come very close to me in the summer months and I just didn't quite understand why. After many, many months of talking with them and counseling with them, I realized that it was because of my feet. I was wearing open-toed shoes. His attacker only wore open-toed shoes. So every time he got near me, it triggered that thought, hence he wanted to stay away from me. I made a small change, I wore closed-toed shoes, and we were able to educate the child. We have to spend time thinking about those small, small things that might make a difference. Trauma-informed training is not cultural, it's not race-based. It has nothing to do with where you go to school, who you go to school with. It doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter how much money your parents make. It is equally across the board. Um, people that experience trauma could be involved in racism, discrimination, and could increase a child's risk for traumatic stress. Social emotional learning. Social emotional learning is one of the key tools that we are using to combat trauma in the classroom setting. Uh, CASEL, which is the collaborative for academic, social, and emotional learning, has put out a study. And in their study, it says that participants have demonstrated significantly improved social and emotional skills, attitudes, behavior, and academic performance that have reflected an 11% point gain in achievement. So on a regular basis, you hear we need to raise test scores. For children that have been affected by a trauma, they may not be able to learn. So let's work on helping them and supporting them. And you will then see the percentage gain in their academic scores. Benefits of a trauma-informed school. First and foremost, supporting the student's needs. And secondly, supporting the teacher's needs. Let's look a little bit about that. At Fall Hamilton, our common goal here is the children. Sometimes kids are in crisis and it's just emotionally draining as a teacher. But at the end of the day, you know that these kids rely on you. So we also need to take care of ourselves. We know you can't help others until you help yourself. Sometimes you just need a minute. One, two, three. You need to step out of your own room, take a deep breath. As educators, you know, we may be having a rough day, and sometimes we get frustrated too. So we have a tap in, tap out strategy here. If something happens in the classroom, teachers have the ability to contact someone on the text chain. If there's a student that needs some extra support, if the teacher needs extra support, then someone else is able to come in and provide that. If you need a minute, you can text someone and be like, hey, can you cover my class? Can you give me a second? And we will gladly cover one another. In terms of faculty support, we feel more supported here in this environment because we know that it's a collaborative effort and everyone is going to be heard. You sometimes just need to ask for help, and it's okay, and it's really accepted here, and it's promoted. No one's alone. We're a ship, and we run together, and there's someone always that has your back. So we learned about recognizing emotion, and it's not about just the emotions of the child, but also the caregiver. Um, how can we support each other? What can we do? How can we support the children? Um, what happens to those people that have been affected by trauma? 
how can we help mental health first aid providers and caregivers work with these children? And what does trauma and ADHD look like? And how can we tell the difference? In section three, we're going to talk about something that is not talked about very often, and it's called teacher burnout. Uh, scholars define teacher burnout as a condition caused by depersonalization, cynicism, poor attitudes towards students, colleagues, and the school itself, a lack of contact with others, and growing isolation, and a diminished sense of accomplishment. Teachers are faced today with more than they ever have been in the past. What's happening is we're noticing a large amount of teachers quitting, leaving the profession. And a lot of that has to do with burnout. No one is supporting them on how to support these children that have been traumatized. So then what they are finding is that teachers are getting something called STS, which is a secondary traumatic stress syndrome. Action plans for teachers are available and appropriate. In the presentation, there is a, a link about teacher burnout, but you have to think about what is causing this. So understanding that burnout is caused by organizational and daily factors. It's crucial because many believe that burnout is teacher specific. Although some individuals are more susceptible to stress, placing the blame on teachers does not address the cause. What does address the cause is finding a way for the children to be supported and not putting all of that on just the educator. Proactively training all school members, just as we're doing now, talking to the teachers, administration, the public safety on the warning signs of mental health issues and how to provide proper assistance to someone who may have a mental health concern. STS, as I mentioned, secondary traumatic stress or compassion fatigue. Teachers who work with students with more um, a adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are more likely to develop this. What you might see in an educator would be withdrawal from friends and family, feeling irritated and angry and unable to feel compassion, unable to focus and place, placing blame on others, feeling hopeless, isolated, guilty, struggling to concentrate, unable to sleep, overeating or not eating enough, and persistent worrying about students. You can't see worry. And teachers oftentimes take that home with them and educators take that home with them. Some supports for teachers would include um, a tap in and tap out system, which we'll watch a, a, a video about how that is a greatly supported uh, system. Taking a walk on your preparation period and putting the things aside that you might have to do right then so that you can help yourself using mindfulness in the school day. We can use mindfulness in the classroom, which would also support the educator. Exercise eating well and allowing students to relax in class for a little while and not just work all day long. Self-care for teachers. Leaving school on time, one or two days a week. Leaving your teacher bag at school, not taking it home with you, exercising, saying no to some extra requests at school, eating breakfast as a staff, camaraderie building, that used to be something that was very common and is not so much anymore, um, and limiting the amount of time that you complain and being proud of the work that you do. The next topic that we're going to talk about is, is just so important when you're talking about uh, traumatic events and child trauma. Is it ADHD or is it child traumatic stress? So studies have shown that children diagnosed with ADHD are more likely to have a traumatic event than children who do not have ADHD. Scientists have also found that ADHD and childhood traumatic stress affect the same region of the brain, including the prefrontal and temporal cortex, which controls emotions, impulses, and decision making. So if you look at the brain, you can see different parts of white batter that have been affected with a child who has trauma and then a different part that's been affected if they have ADHD. So trauma, ADHD, and other mental health correlations. Research is showing that academic achievement can be improved through early detection of mental health problems. 
timely referrals to access of appropriate services, like counseling services. Mental health services are not just for students who are already suffering, but also for those that may develop a problem in the future. That's why we talk about SEL imp implementation or social emotional learning. If everyone has a toolbox full of tools to deal with problems, they will do better as they grow. Only 40% of students with mental illness seek help. We need to reduce that stigma. ADHD, and what do we know? We know that scientists have discovered a strong genetic link since ADHD can run in families. Some more than 20 genetic studies have shown the evidence that ADHD is strongly inherited. It's a complex disorder, which is the result of multiple genetic interactions, other factors in the environment, and may increase the likelihood of having ADHD. Some things could be exposure to lead or pesticides, premature birth, low birth weight, brain injury, or parental exposure to alcohol and drugs. That leads us to this overlap the overlap of ADHD and traumatic stress. Young children who experience trauma may have symptoms of hyperactivity and disruptive behavior that resemble ADHD. Again, we talk about what's wrong with this child or what has happened with, to this child. Trauma can make children feel agitated, troubled, nervous on high alert, and it can be mistaken for hyperactivity. What might seem like inattention in children who experience trauma might actually be symptoms of disassociation or feelings of unreality or being outside of one's body or the result of avoidance. Intrusive thoughts or memories of trauma, feeling like it happened all over again, may lead to confused and agitated behavior. Every day I found a child who would walk into the classroom, put their things down, walk back out into the hallway and sit down. So why don't you want to come in? Well, it's too loud in there. Well, I need you to come in because I can't teach you. It took a long time for us to figure out that his household had 45 people living in a two bedroom home. So any time that he was in a, an environment where there was about that many people, he then shut down. So it doesn't have to be agitated in behaviors. It can be withdrawal behaviors. We have to look, we have to find, we have to seek the issue. So section four, how can we take action? Child line. As an educator, you do not have to report to someone else. You can absolutely call the 1-800 number and child, line your, and child line for yourself. Mandated reporters, that is everyone who is a stakeholder in a child, adolescent, or, or youth's life. Um, keep, the Keep Kids Safe website is very, very important. There's a lot of great information there. I want to talk a little bit about what some of the things that the Diocese of Greensburg has been doing. Um, they created this culture of child safety, like an army of over 15,000 people have been trained and they are trained by something called Virtus, which is protecting God's children. So they're recognizing that's the signs of grooming and possible abuse. They're doing the mandated reporter trainings, um, standard work trainings, calling child line, just as I had talked about before. And then Catholic Charities is so important here where they are available all the time to help any survivor, but anybody in the community that's looking to talk about a possible traumatic event that may have happened. The diocese includes 12 schools, 78 parishes in Armstrong, Fayette, Indiana, and Westmoreland counties. The continuum of care looks a little bit like this. Your home, your schools, your parishes, your communities, your classrooms, and all together we need to be looking at social and emotional learning, something that is not just happening at home anymore and needs to happen in our schools. For more information, you wanna check out Castle School Guide to Implementing SEL. Um, my nonprofit can help support that as well. Catholic Charities link is available to you here. They also have information and support for you for counseling. All the resources that I talked about today are available in the PowerPoint, but I just want to say thank you so much for spending your time 
and listening to what I feel is very important and something that we need to talk more about, reducing the stigma of mental health, supporting children and youth, and providing them the resources that they need in our schools and not just in our homes.